to be his own, to live with him forever. And because of that, we can trust this Father's heart. And that is good news. Today, we offer a second partial answer to this question by looking at the role of the Son. And the message is very simple and straightforward. Jesus really does save us, and we can rest in him. He doesn't just kind of save us. He doesn't mostly save us and then leave a bunch of stuff for us to do, uh, you know, to contribute to our salvation. He decisively and definitively saves us so that we can be at peace. Our hearts can rest in him and in his full provision for us. As I uh, put together this message, I realized that there were two distinct groups of people that I was going to be addressing myself to today. The first consists of those of you who uh, maybe have not yet crossed the line in your journey of faith. You're interested in this Christianity thing, or maybe you aren't so interested, but were re reluctantly dragged to church. I don't want to presume anything. But, uh, but you're kind of testing the water spiritually. And I, if that describes you, I'm so glad you're here. And we welcome you. We want you to take what time you need to uh, evaluate the truth claims of Scripture. What I have to say today, I think, is going to be particularly relevant for you because it is going to describe very simply what is involved in this faith transaction with Jesus. And we're going to have a chance to pray at the end of it. And if uh, that is something that would be a benefit to you, to come up and pray with someone and kind of seal the deal, cross the line, uh, then I invite you to do that. There's a second group of people that uh, I'm going to be speaking to today, and that consists of those of you who have been Christians for perhaps many, many years. But you're up against a, a point in your life where you're really questioning whether you've got what it takes to make it over the finish line, struggling so much with sin, with temptation, wondering if God really loves you, if his salvation really can uh, effectively save you. And I want to encourage your hearts today that what Christ did on the cross 2,000 years ago is still applicable today. Uh, we have to preach the gospel to ourselves daily. All of us do. Because life is hard. Christian life is hard. And so this will be a reminder for you, if you're struggling, that Christ really, really does save. And therefore, you can rest in him. All right, with that said, let's look at uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. The Apostle Paul is writing here, and he says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Paul is here describing, and he describes it elsewhere, two ways. Two ways to live our lives. One way is what he calls the way of the flesh. And flesh is kind of shorthand in Paul for those independent powers that each of us possesses that were meant to be used in communion with God. But when used independent of God can often become self-absorption, uh, uh, absorptive and destructive. And you say, don't go that way. That way ends in death. You don't want to walk down that road. There's another way I want you to live, and that's the way of the Spirit. 
where you live in communion with God's heart. And you're following the, the promptings of His Holy Spirit so that wherever you are, uh, you can have the assurance He's with you, He's working in you and through you. And He says, that's the way of life and peace. So we're going to tease those two ways out today, but before we do, we want to ask God to prepare our hearts. I don't know what kind of week you've had. Mine has been super busy. And we just need to be in the presence of God and ask His Holy Spirit to now quiet us, kind of clear the distractions, and then open the eyes of our spiritual understanding so that we can hear the truth that the Holy Spirit wants to teach us today. So let's close our eyes. And if you would, please, just ask the Holy Spirit now, in the name of Jesus, to be your teacher, to share with you exactly what it is he wants you to hear today. And now tell him that you're willing, to the best of your ability, to apply what he's teaching you today, to do what he tells you to do. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we rejoice in you. We've worshipped you through our time of singing, and we hope your heart has been pleased by that. And now we worship you in a little bit different way, and that is by offering to you our ears and our attention, our understanding, so that you can shape us. You can mold our thinking, shape our hearts. And so, Lord, I'm asking that each of us, myself included, that you would change us as a result of this next half hour or so. For we ask it all in the name of Jesus, our Lord. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, some of you know that I was raised in an atheist home at a time when that was uh, pretty uncommon. It's more common today. But in my house, we, we didn't go to church. We never prayed, never talked about God. The few occasions when I did uh, talk with my dad about God, um, it was very clear that uh, he had no place for religion in his life. He believed it to be a crutch for those who were too weak to stand on their own two feet. Now, there is indication at the end of my dad's uh, long life that there was a turning uh, in the last year, and uh, I am hopeful that I'll meet him in heaven. But um, at that time, there was a, uh, an ignorance of God, not and I don't blame them for that. They, they were great parents who raised me well to the best of their ability. But God simply wasn't a factor in our lives. I went away to college, and within the first week, I met another guy on the wrestling team who had what I would consider a qualitatively superior life. It wasn't that he had more stuff than I had or was happier than me or had reason to be happier than me, but there was a depth in his life. There was a multidimensionality to his life. Uh, mine was pretty linear, you know, when I got an A on a test or won a wrestling tournament, I was happy, and when I didn't, I was sad. Uh, kind of cause and effect. In his case, it was like he, this joy, this peace that transcended uh, whatever was going on in his day-to-day -day life. In fact, that year, he blew out his knee. He was one of the better wrestlers on the team. Blew out his knee, ended his career. Would have totally devastated me. But he went through that with equanimity and poise and grace. He continued to minister to the rest of us on the team, continued to hobble up to wrestling practice on his crutches and his full-length cast. It was astounding to see what he went through. Oh, I'm the one with the dark hair. We began a Bible study, some uh, other athletes in our dorm, and it was as I was examining God's word 
uh, that something began to happen to me. See, prior to this time, the path I had chosen, uh, which obviously excluded God, uh, was a moral pathway. Uh, not everyone chose that, uh, but in my case, it worked for me. And so, um, you know, I, I worked hard in school, worked hard at sports, um, got good grades, was nice to people, didn't cuss, didn't do drugs, didn't drink, didn't go to parties, didn't chase women, uh, didn't do the things that I had associated with, you know, a uh, kind of lifestyle that uh, didn't contribute to my goals of being a good student and a good athlete. And there's nothing particularly virtuous about that, by the way, because, again, it was done independent of God, but it's just the path that I was on. Well, but as I began to read God's Word, I saw that that morality of my life was just a thin, thin veneer, and God began to strip it away. It's like I was looking at my heart under ambient light, and it looked pretty darn good, you know? I could pat myself on the back compared to these guys, you know, or run around all the time. Felt pretty good. But God then turns on this 500 megawatt light and shines it at my heart, and I realized that I had what Joseph Conrad would describe as a heart of darkness a heart that was just wrapped up in itself, filled with pride and selfishness and petty ambition. You don't have to be around God very long before you are struck with an acute awareness of the yawning chasm that exists between who you are and how you're living and whom you ought to be and how you ought to live. There is this gigantic gulf between the two. And you read of guys in Scripture who were brought up short in their spiritual lives. Righteous men, we're told. Job, righteous man, who at the end of that book has this encounter with God and falls on his face and says, Oh God, I've spoken one, I will not speak again. I was presumptuous, Lord. You are far greater, far holier far wiser than I ever imagined. Isaiah, when he meets the Lord in the temple, and he says, man, I'm done for. I'm a goner because I'm a sinner, and I live among sinners. And my eyes have seen the Lord, the King of glory. You Christians are going to experience this periodically throughout your lives, and that's a good thing. You're going to be tooling along and, you know, relatively comfortable in your walk with Christ. And then you're going to catch a fresh glimpse of God's vastness and his transcendent otherness and holiness. And it's going to wreck you. And you're going to fall on your face and you're going to say, oh, God, am I even saved? How can I approach such a holy one? And guys, that's your invitation to go deeper with the Lord. That's your invitation to live in his holy fear and to come before him and say, oh, Lord, thank you that you paid the price for me to be joined to you. You sent your son as a lifeline so that we could be connected. Now, you engineering nerds may appreciate this approach. Think of your life in terms of your movement toward holiness over time. So on the, uh, the lateral axis there, the horizontal axis, you see time and years, and then your relative holiness in terms of percentage, and here you are. Uh, your slope may be steeper than this or shallower than that, uh, but you see over time that you're growing closer to the Lord, growing in your awareness of what it means to live the Christian life, and hopefully you're becoming more and more the person that God designed you to be. That's what he's called us to do. However, there's a problem, and the problem is this. Jesus Christ, the one who embodied uh, what it means to be fully human, set an impossibly high standard for us. 
And we fall desperately short of that at any point in our spiritual journey. And so if you were to measure this at some point, you would see that there is this delta, this differential, this impossibly great gap that must be bridged for you to go from where you are to where you ought to be and where I ought to be. What do we do with the gap? Right? That's the problem. And there are a couple different options that present themselves to us. One option is to try to fill that gap with lots and lots of religious and spiritual activity. To make ourselves really, 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 really good. To follow the rules, to be nice to people, to give to others, to be respectable and polite, to go to church, pray, read the Bible, clean up our moral life. You know what I'm talking about, right? Don't dance, don't drink, don't chew, don't go out with girls that do. <laughs> now the problem with this kind of life is that you never know how much is enough. Imagine that you really develop spiritually to the point where you are able to pray consistently and strenuously for four hours a day. And you're praying for your family, you're praying for your circle of friends, you're praying for Chico, you're praying for Butte County, you're praying for everything in the world. And you die and you go to heaven and God says, too bad, you came really close, but my standard was four hours and one minute per day. Sorry, you're out of here. How do you know? How do you know if you're sincere enough? We're to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. How do you know if you're really loving him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and not just 99.99999%? You see, if this is what determines our ultimate destiny, we are in a world of hurt, folks. Because you never know how much is enough. Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this, that, and the other thing for you? And he said, I'm going to have to say to them, man, I'm sorry. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who do wickedness. How do you know you're not going to be part of that group? That I'm not going to be part of that group, you see? This way doesn't provide the answer. And because of that, you can never rest. You always have to be doing. And that kind of life is exhausting. Flannery O'Connor lamented that her faith rises and falls like the tides of an invisible sea. And most of us who are honest can say the same. We have good days where we're doing great, praying, you know, being a good testimony to others. And maybe we're actually tempted on those days to look down on others who aren't doing it quite the way we're doing it. And then there are the bad days that we wish weren't part of the record. The bad days where we blow up big time, we trip over ourselves that breeds such uncertainty and insecurity and fear. See, there's no peace in that way. In fact, Paul says it is the way of death. You're going to kill your soul if you try to run on this treadmill. Because, see, filling that gap with your good deeds really is just another way of saying it's filling it with you, which is more of you. Maybe the best side of you, but it's still you. And you cannot fill the gaps, nor can I. This is just one more self-salvation scheme, and there are many. It doesn't work. As long as we think that it works, then we're going to exclude ourselves from the one way where we can be saved. Because the only person that God cannot save is the person who will not be saved because he's not admitting that he needs God's salvation. See, God's mercy is free to all, but it's only those who recognize their need of his mercy that cry out for it and receive it and live in it and don't try to prove themselves anymore. 
So what's the solution? Well, if we're on this path, and some of you may be, you need to surrender. You need to give up. You need to send up the white flag and say, enough is enough. Jesus said, come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. You know, learn from my teachings, and you will find rest for your souls. So that leads us to the second way. Oh, if we can't fill up that gap with our good works, what can we fill it with? Well, the second way is to fill the gap by allowing God to fill it with Jesus. Paul calls this way the way of the Spirit, the Spirit who gives life. And here we acknowledge that Jesus pays the whole price for our sin, that when he hung on the cross and he said, it is finished, it was definitive, it was a historical event that was done for all eternity. Our price, the price of our sin was paid for. And we receive him into our lives and he begins to clean the inside of the cup as he used in one uh, message with religious leaders. He begins to reorder our deepest affections and our desires. He begins to reorder our private world. And it's at that point where we realize there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because sin has been condemned in Christ. When Christ died on the cross, sin was dealt a death blow so that we can be free. Jesus really does save us, and we really can rest in him. That's why this way, Paul calls, the way of life and peace. This is where we find the abundance of life, the joy, the peace that God promised us. It's in recognizing that he's done it. We don't have to add to it. We merely need to receive it and then act in accordance with it. And out of gratitudes of love and uh, uh, hearts of gratitude and love, we live out of it lives of grateful obedience. And so this allows us to face that gap honestly with energy and hope and optimistic determination, knowing that, yeah, I'm not there yet, and you know what? I'm never going to be there in this life, and that's okay, and God's okay with that. As long as I continue to follow him and seek to, to walk with him and follow his spirit, I'm going to be doing exactly what he's asked me to do. And there are going to be times where, you know, I get a little rebellious, and, and he has to, you know, discipline me, and but I'm not going to grovel in the dirt forever. I'm going to get back up and I'm going to walk with him. Guys, that's what God wants from all of us. He, he wants us simply to put one foot in front of the other and trust him each step along the way and to work in us and through us so that we can be a blessing to others. Now, a very important question surfaces, and that is how does Christ save us? And the answer may be a little bit more complex than you're thinking. Because when you ask, how does God save you, 99.9% .9 of Christians would say this way. He does it through the cross. And that's not actually true. Now, he uses the cross. That's part of what he does to save us. But that is not what saves us. The cross is just an instrument. It's an instrument of torture in the Roman world. What is it that saves us? Jesus himself, the person, the living, vital person of Jesus Christ. And the way we're saved is that God joins my life with his own in the person of Jesus Christ. So that now everything that is God's becomes mine. And I'm no longer living life in the flesh, on my own, independent of God. I'm living in the Spirit, connected to God. Guys, this is the only way to be made right with God. The only way to experience His blessing 
the only way to experience life in all of its fullness. See, he created you to be united to him. Every single one of you. It's not just for super saints. It's for Joe Blow average Christian. You were created specifically designed to have a life that integrated with God's life. It's like this lamp. It's a beautiful lamp. It's got a neat little, you know, pivoting thingamajig here. Brass, you know. It's got light bulb that has all the fixtures. It's got a little dealy bobber here that, yeah. sorry about the technical terminology. I don't know what they're called. But, you know, it's a beautiful lamp. Only problem is it has no life in itself. It can't work. The only way it can work is if I connect it to a life source, then it does what a lamp is supposed to do. Apart from the life source, apart from the electricity flowing into it, it can't do what it was designed to do. Guys, you and I were designed to live in communion with God every moment of every day. Your mind was shaped to do that. Your heart was shaped to hold God. Your mouth was made to speak His praises and declare His goodness. Your feet were made to bear the good news of His gospel. You, all of you, was designed. All of who you are, designed to be connected vitally to God. And this is the key, you guys. This is the key to living the Christian life is that we merely stay connected to Him. You know, most people, they, if you ask them, most Christians, you ask what their identity is, they'll say, well, my identity is as a Christian. And again, that's partially true, but the Bible, New Testament only uses Christian three times. But you know what it uses multiple times? That you are a person in Christ. 167 times in the letters of Paul alone. Our basic identity is that we are men and women who are connected. We are united. Our life is fused to the life of another and not just any other. The one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus our lives are enfolded into him, engrafted into him, engulfed by him. In fact, the Bible uses four different metaphors to express this reality. It's such a, a difficult thing to wrap our brains around. But consider in 1 Corinthians 12, it uses the anatomical metaphor of the head and the body. Christ is the head, you're the body. What happens when you detach the body from the head? It doesn't end well, does it? You've got a corpse. Body and head are organically joined in the same way we are organically joined to Jesus as believers. In John 15, the Lord Jesus uses the metaphor of, that comes from viticulture, and that is the vine and the branches. He's the vine. We're merely a branch plugged into him, connected to him, and then through him we bear fruit that calls attention to him. So that when we do good stuff, people see it and they say, wow, I want to get to know this God you know because he must be wonderful because the stuff you're doing is wonderful. But the fruit is simply the expression of the life of Christ flowing into us and out of us. A third metaphor that's used is a genealogical metaphor. Places like Romans 5 and 2 Corinthians 5 where we're told that offspring take on the character traits of their predecessors. And so we're born into this world sinners. We're born uh, as part of the human family that goes back to Adam and Eve, our first parents, who turned their backs on God, rebelled against God, and that virus is part of the human condition. We're born with that. So when we are in Adam, we bear the fruit of Adam. We look like Adam. We do the bad stuff that people outside of God do. But when we're transferred from that reality into a new reality, and we're given a new birthright, we're born again by God's Holy Spirit, God puts His divine DNA in us. 
The word used in John 3 is the sperma of God. The genetic material of God is in our hearts so that now we look like God, our new parent. And then the fourth analogy that is used is that of marriage. In Ephesians 5, Christ is the husband, we, the church, are the wife, and just like every marriage where you have this intermingling of lives, where there's no longer my and your, it's ours. There's this new reality, this new identity that's forged between two separate persons who retain their separate identities and yet combine to make a new one. And that's true of us as believers. God doesn't make us anything less than what we were before we came to Christ. To the contrary, far more. And now all of Christ's resources become ours and ours become his. But I think perhaps the best visual reminder of what it means to be united with Christ is not one that we find in the Bible, but this one. Some of you may have read about these two, Abby and Brittany Hinsel, 27-year-olds, born conjoined. They share a torso, you know, they have just two legs, two arms, but two heads and some other internal organs. But here you have two people, one body. And it's that image that the Bible gives us when it talks about our being united with Christ. And go with me, go with me for a minute on this. It's, it's beautiful and can help us to make sense of this. So what does it mean to be united to Christ? Well, first of all, it means that what happened to Christ happened to me. When Christ was crucified on the cross, guess what? I was crucified. I died to sin just as Christ died to sin. When Christ was buried, I was buried. When Christ was raised, I was raised. When he ascended to the right hand of the Father and sits at the Father's right hand, guess where I am? At the Father's right hand, Ephesians 2. And what's true of me is true of you. Every believer is united to Christ so that everything that Christ went through, you've gone through. So that when God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You are so inseparably joined to him that he doesn't distinguish the one from the other. Guys, this is the reason that we can rest in the hope that he's given us, the assurance that on that final day, God is not going to say, you missed it by a minute. He's going to say, welcome, good and faithful servant. My son paid the price for you. Come and share your master's happiness. That is good news. Yeah. And by the way, this reality is played out in baptism, water baptism, right? Our being placed into Christ. But there's a flip side to this coin. There's another side to this, and that is that wherever I go, Christ goes, right? It's true of these two. One of them can't decide to go to the grocery store and the other to the theater. They go together. Wherever you go, Christ is there and with all of his power, all of his authority, all of his love, all of his compassion, all of his understanding and patience. So when you're facing that really difficult temptation and you want to give in and there's no one else around, remember, you are joined to Christ. He is with you. And all of his endless resources are available to you in that moment. And he will not put you in situations that you can't handle. You're going to be in lots of situations you don't think you can handle. But no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. God is faithful, will not allow you to be attempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the means of escape that you might be able to endure it, 1 Corinthians 10. It's true of all of us. You're having a hard time loving someone who's being unloving, guess what? Jesus can do that for you. Having a hard time obeying when Jesus is calling you to costly obedience, guess what? Jesus was the supremely obedient one. He always obeyed the Father, even when he sweated blood and said, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. He obeyed, and he can help you obey, and he can help me obey. 
Guys, this is good news. Wherever you go, Jesus is there. Whatever he's done, you've done with him by his grace. Because of that, we can rest. We can know that the price really was paid once and for all, definitively, exhaustively. Nothing more is going to be asked of us in terms of contributing to our salvation. Now, much is asked of us in terms of living out our lives with gratitude and love and obedience. It's not just a, a free ride that we go and we sin it up until we die. No, he's changed us on the inside out. And we're to live that way. Well, friend, my hope is that wherever you are in your Christian life, that you'll take this image with you. And you'll realize you are always with, with Christ. He is always with you. And that is how he saves us. And that is good news. Let's stand to pray. If you need prayer for anything, we've got prayer teams down here. Prayer teams, come on down. Uh, we'd love to be able to pray for you. For the rest of you, let me dismiss you with a benediction. This comes from the same book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 13. And it goes like this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in his peace. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. See you next week.